The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Hello, welcome to Beckman Auditorium, welcome to Caltech. Uh, my name is Henry Lester and I serve as Executive Officer for Neuroscience in the Division of Biology. Before introducing Viviana Gradinaro, I want to remind you that the next Watson Lecture will be on January 9th 
uh, will be given by Harvey Newman and is entitled Physics at the Large Hadron Collider, a new window on matter, space-time, and the universe. Between now and then, though, as you can see, we have a new window on the brain. Um, <clears throat> Viviana began her undergraduate work at the University of Bucharest in Romania, and uh, it became possible for Caltech to enable her to continue her undergraduate education here. She began studying physics, but soon fell in love with biology and in particular neuroscience here in the laboratory of Professor Paul Patterson, who's sitting proudly in the front row. And uh, also at that time, um, I had the pleasure of teaching an undergraduate course, required freshman biology for non-majors. To keep it interesting, we entitled it Drugs and the Brain. And, <laughs> and uh, Viviana became an undergraduate teaching assistant for that course. You could usually find Viviana surrounded by a group of admiring freshmen. And she also developed a lot of the instructional and assessment materials for that course. Uh, she then went to Stanford to do her PhD work in the laboratory of Professor Carl Dyseroth and in the bioengineering department doing neuroscience. And the techniques and intellectual advances that Viviana made during those, that period are really remarkable. She will describe them tonight. She then remained at Stanford for a couple of years, leading a project on cracking the neural code, which she is doing here at Caltech as well. We were again delighted to be able to persuade her to return to Caltech, this time as assistant professor of biology on the faculty. And so those instructional materials in addition, those instructional materials that she developed almost 10 years ago are now being used in an online course called Drugs and the Brain uh, with 65,000 students that I'm running, uh, a MOOC, massive open online course. But it's much more fun to look at you tonight instead of a webcam and to proudly introduce Assistant Professor Viviana Gradinaro. Good evening. Thank you so much for being with here, uh, here with me tonight. Um, and I hope you enjoy the movie that you just saw. Um, it's um, a movie of a brain, a mouse brain. And it was quite painstaking work. It was work done in the laboratory of Professor Stephen Smith at Stanford. And it involved many graduate years. However, the result is rather remarkable, as you can see. And today I want to tell you about the interaction between light and the brain, and I'll tell you what use light is for our daily life and also for the brain research, and some applications for therapeutical purposes. So without uh, further ado, I want to tell you how this beautiful movie was made. And if you can notice here, there is the very thin stripe that you just saw, so the, the movie that you saw, it's from a very narrow volume in the brain. And it was generated by making very, very thin slices and added chemicals to them that could label different neuronal structures in different colors, and then imaging very small pieces of that one at a time, and then putting them all back together um, with a computer to generate the 3D rendering. This was done in the mouse brain. Imagine the workload if this was done in a human brain. So what you see in the right is the difference in scale. And the colors in green, you can see neurons, which are like, a lot like trees. You have the axons for their roots, and you have the dendrites for their um, branches. And you can see them due to fluorescent proteins um, that can absorb light and emit light as well. And we can see them under the microscope. In blue, you can see microtubules, which are the skeleton of the cells. And in green, very, in red, very interestingly, you can see the synapses. These are point of contacts between cells and also points of communication. So these beautiful images were facilitated by use of light. 
And light is incredibly versatile, as all of you know. Light not only facilitates growing biological systems, but it also enables us to study biological systems. And in my lab, we are interested in studying the brain. So we can use light to grow um, neurons in, in a way, and we can also use light to visualize neuronal structures. And Feynman, our own Feynman, famously said, if you want to know something about the marvelous biological system, just look at the thing. So we can use light to look at the thing. But today what I want to focus on is not the ability of light to grow biological systems or the ability of light to help us understand biological systems by visualizing. I want to focus instead on a novel technology that was emerging in 2005 and that I worked on in my graduate work at Stanford, and that's the ability of light to control cells in a very, very specific fashion. So today, um, we will take a journey through how the technology was developed, um, how is it possible to use light to control neurons in the brain, and what are some of the applications for this technology. So the technology is called optogenetics, and there is a very precise need for it. I want to describe the challenge of the human brain. So if you just focus on this extremely small brain area. It's called hypothalamus. It's deep inside the brain. And if we look in it and we expand that area and we label just two cell types, one in green and one in red, you can see that they are highly intermingled. And what you don't see here is all the black areas. Those are yet other cell types that are intermingled with the cell types in the hypothalamus. And this is very important because these different cell types in the small brain structure deep within the brain are responsible, were shown to be responsible for very different behaviors. And so it happens that the cells labeled here in green and red were shown to be responsible for thirst and social bonding. So what happens if we try to control any of these behaviors? One method is to put a stimulating electrode that passes a current and activates cells in the surrounding area in a non-discriminate fashion. So if we put an electrode in this area and we pass a current, this activates neuronal cells of all these different types. And what you end up with is a very, very confused animal. <laughs> um, so what we want to do instead is to be able to go only in one cell type at a time, or two at most, to both understand what their role is and also control them when they go wrong. And how could we do that? So rather than using electrical stimulation, which has been very uh, popular and has been very successfully used even for clinical purposes, I want to highlight a clinical application before I move into the technology. Um, this gentleman here is Dr. Penfield, a British neurosurgeon who in mid-1950s used electrical stimulation in his epileptic patients to map the cortex, and he could precisely localize areas of our brain that are involved in controlling our arms or our legs. Um, and he generated the so-called human homunculus by using this method. And furthermore, the same electrical stimulation is currently being used in humans very su successfully to treat symptoms of uh, Parkinson disorder. And this happens by placing deep stimulation electrodes in the motor centers of the brain, pass electrical current, and this miraculously takes care of the tremor. I will focus on this particular therapy and application in the second part of the talk, but first I want to describe the, the technology that we are using in our laboratory at Caltech to understand some of these circuits. So I want to propose you, what if instead of using light to see different cell types, we could use light to activate cells at the same time. And what would, this would allow us is to have very precise control or of defined neurons. If you apply a current to these two different neurons, you can activate both of them at the same time. What we could do instead is envision a technology where you introduce modulators only in a defined cell type. You could introduce those modulators by using uh, genetic tricks, which act like zip codes for proteins. You can send those proteins and direct their expression only in the cell types of interest. So you could put these little 
regulators of neuronal activity. They could be either inhibitory, excitatory, in defined cell types. And what's special about these modulators is that they respond to light. So when they absorb photons, they can open a pore, and upon opening of this pore, they allow ion flux in and out of the cell. And this ion flux is very important because depending on the nature of the ions, they can mediate very interesting behaviors in neurons. In this case, what I'm showing is an opsin called chanorhodopsin 2 that when absorbs blue light photons can allow sodium ions to go into neurons. And what this causes is neuronal activity. So it triggers action potentials with very high temporal precision. So we can combine these channels with the application of light to activate cells in a very well-defined manner, genetic, genetically defined and temporally defined as well. And we have a natural partner for chanorhodopsin and halorhodopsin. Not only it's interesting to be able to activate cells, but at least for basic research, it's very important that we are able to identify a circuit that controls a specific behavior. And one way we can do that is to silence the circuit. So we shut off and then we see what's the effect on behavior. And this is possible due to another tool that we call halorhodopsin. And this is a pump, a chloride pump. So in the same fashion as chanorhodopsin, when it absorbs yellow light photons, it can pump chloride ions inside the neurons. And what this achieves is very precise neuronal inhibition with high temporal precision. So where do these come from? They're rather um, interesting tools, and they have an even more interesting origin. Chanorhodopsin came from a unicellular green alga from fresh water. And its role in its host, so this is the Chlamydomonas reinhardti. It's a very simple organism, one cell, and it has this opsin in the eye spot. You can see the eye spot here. It's full with chanorhodopsin proteins. And the role of the chanorhodopsin proteins in the eye spot is to mediate the survival of the alga. Because when it absorbs light, the chanorhodopsin mediates calcium currents, and this propels the flagellum. See these two arms here? These are, in a way, um, as the le legs are for us, these are the legs for the flagellum. It moves, it helps the alga move towards the food source. So when it absorbs light, they beat around, and then it propels the organism towards light, and which is most times also the food source. So it not only facilitates the survival of this very simple organism, but we can extract this protein. So we extract this protein from the eye spot, and we package it into vectors to express it in mammalian cells. And what can we, we can do in our laboratory, and I'll tell you later how we do that, is to express the opsin into neuronal cells. And what you see here is a neuron um, from the hippocampus of a rodent that expresses in green chanorhodopsin throughout the cellular membrane. And when we apply blue light to this neuron, we can see action potentials, which is the language of, the, of neurons. So with each blue light pulse, you can see neurons talking to each other. So we have a very well temporal control. And only the neurons that have this opsin will um, activate, will be activated by light. So um, it's good we got these from very interesting um, origins. I mentioned uh, chanorhodopsin came from Chlamydomonas reinhardti, from the glen alga. And then we have the inhibitory tool that came from a bacterium. And this bacterium, it's named Natronomonas pharaonis. So very distant sources. And we encountered quite a few challenges. If anything, it's uh, we took it for granted that we can get a protein from an organism that's very distant from us, very different in its survival needs and capacities, and take those proteins and put them into mammalian cells and hope that they behave just the same. So we encounter some challenges that I will tell you about and um, how we um, were able to overcome these challenges. So, but first, um, I want to show you how chanorhodopsin was successfully used to control rodent behavior in vivo. So chanorhodopsin, when taken from the green alga uh, without any modification, worked beautifully um, in our ability to express it throughout the brain and also control certain behaviors in animals. So what you see here is a brain slice 
um, of a mouse brain that expresses channelrhodopsin fused to a green fluorescent protein to allow to, uh, uh, us to see under the microscope. So you can see her expression in neuronal cells of the cortex throughout the brain. And what we can do in these rodents is to place a fiber optic on top of the cortex in defined brain areas, brain areas that are responsible for interesting behaviors. And I will show you next a movie where we can use a combination of light and options to control motor behavior in rodents. So what you'll see in this movie is a rodent that has the excitatory option in the motor cortex and the fiber optic, the light source, is also placed there. So as soon as you start the light, the animal rotates. And this lasts for as long um, as the light is on. As you can see, when the light stops, the animal returns to its normal behavior, unperturbed. So um, this is a rather striking result. And it shows us that we can control animal behavior in vivo. And in this experiment, um, I should mention that 33.3% um, of the animals move to the left, 33.3 move to the right, and the third animal ran away. <laughs> so uh, we repeated and got the right statistics afterwards. So importantly, this technology not only allows us to control animal behavior, but very interestingly, at the same time, allows us to see what we are doing inside the brain. And this is very important. Alternative technologies, such as electrical stimulation, don't allow you that because of the stimulation artifact associated with it. However, in the case of optical stimulation, it's fully compatible with electrical recording of neurons. So what you can see here is a device that we use um, that allows light to go through a fiber optic, and then we have an electrode to record what the brain is doing. So in this behavior, in the behavior video that I just showed you, you can not only control the behavior, but understand what happens in the brain at the same time that you are controlling the behavior. And we do this by recording. So what you can see here is neuronal populations getting activated by brief pulses of light with very high precision, so we can record in real time. So this was the success story in a way. An opsin that came from a single cell organism, a very remote organism, we managed to package it and put it into rodents and control behavior. And all went very smoothly, um, much to our surprise. However, when we tried to do the same with the inhibitory tools, we encountered some challenges that were not that unexpected. So the source for the inhibitory opsins comes from Natronomonas pharaonis, and this bacteria lives in a very salty lake in the Sahara Desert. So all of the rules, the biological rules, are slightly different. The pH at which this um, organism function, the ion concentrations are different, the amount of protein that the bacteria needs to make in order to uh, have proper functioning. So all these are very different. So when we try to take this protein and package it into vectors and put it into mammalian cells, our first um, results were rather disconcerting. So what we saw was protein aggregating inside the cells. So you can see here the halorhodopsin protein, as indicated by green dots, aggregating. And this would grow and in the end poison the cells, which is rather disturbing because we want to have a safe tool that we can use to probe circuits. Um, and we were very motivated to understand what the mechanism was for the aggregation and hope that we can find some rules to reverse that and to have a, a well-tolerated tool in vivo. So what we did was to check for the source of the problem. And the solution came from the fact that we realized that the protein was aggregating in the endoplasmic reticulum. You can think of the endoplasmic reticulum as the protein factory of the cell. It makes the proteins and then it sends them to their um, functional locations. However, the way proteins exit the endoplasmic reticulum in our cells, it's by directed, either by bulk flow or by directed exit. They have certain tags 
that tell the proteins where to go, when, where they are needed. So when we took this protein from a very foreign organism and we put it into mammalian cells, the cells didn't know what to do with it. The protein didn't have the instruction of where to go. So what we did was to attach back those sequences, to take sequences from mammalian proteins and put them back onto the opsin in order for the mammalian cells to recognize what the problem is and to ship the opsins to the necessary locations. So this method was rather successful. What you can see here is by a series of protein modifications. So we engineered the protein to be better tolerated. Here's where we started with aggregated protein. And by engineering the protein, we were able to export it from endoplasmic reticulum and also introduce it more into the membrane. The opsins are necessary in the membrane for full functionality. So um, you can see here a section of a neuron and you can see that the opsin is expressed very all well on the cellular wall. And the effect of this is very good inhibitory currents. When you apply yellow light to the neurons, what you can see is very safe and long-lasting currents. And furthermore, you can achieve inhibition with red light. I mentioned that halorhodopsin responds to yellow light. However, with increased currents, you can get response in red light. And this is very important. It is very important because of the light properties. As you increase, so this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. This is what we see. We are rather limited in our capacities. Out of the entire spectrum, we perceive a very, very small percentage of it. As you increase the wavelength towards red shifted, you decrease the energy. And what does this mean? You might be familiar with the very bad effect of ultraviolet waves. If we go towards the blue shifted waves, these have high energy and they're little to cells and they can damage cells. However, if instead we go towards red wavelengths, those are safer and better tolerated by tissue. So the desire is to have opsins, not only that are functional, but that can function with safe light levels, especially for, for in vivo applications. The way we can generate this is by creating many different kind of opsins. And here I'm plotting just a few ones that we worked on. And this is their uh, light response spectra. This is the peak. So channel rhodopsin peak is around 470 nanometers, which is blue light. And then we have inhibitory opsins, which all peak at different wavelengths. And in addition to the safety of light, to the safety of red shifted light, there is another important uh, property, which is penetrance of light. You might be familiar with this effect. Red light goes further than the blue light. The same happens in the case um, of our experiments. When we try to use blue light in vivo, there's a very limited capacity on what volume we can activate. However, if we have red light responsive opsins, we can control much larger areas of the brain with ease. And this allows us to control entire circuits and not only focus locally on a few cells at a time. So there is a very high need to develop opsins of different colors. And we've been working on this um, by two means. One is to ge uh, generate variants of the existing opsins that have slightly different properties. And another method is to just engineer them de novo. And when we have different colors, we can do very interesting things. For example, in this cells here, we can introduce halorhodopsin that's responsive to yellow light, and then we can introduce channelrhodopsin that's responsive to blue light, and play light pulses to write in the neural code that we want. So you can start with cells that have their intrinsic voice, and you can completely erase the activity by using yellow light, and then just play in blue pulses to generate the desired code. And you can see here the precision is very, very high. These brief pulses are two milliseconds long. So it's a remarkable uh, speed. And the construct here that we used, it's a fusion between the inhibitory and the excitatory opsin. And what the science mirror here in this regime, you can activate the cell. So you can notice that as you stay with the blue wavelengths, you only activate the cells. And when you go towards red shifted wavelengths, you inhibit the cells. So with the same construct, you can step through different colors and change the balance between inhibition and excitation within the same cell. So one way to generate even more diversity in the opsins is to look at our environmental niches and trace the relatives of this interesting um, algae and bacteria and see what other 
potential is there? What other sources could we mine to get even more diverse options than we have? And what you can see here is um, just a beautiful evolutionary tree that shows that alga and bacteria, they have lots of relatives themselves as well. And some of them are related, some of them not, some of them conflict with each other. And we can go on each one of these arbors and see, would we like a proton pump which would cause inhibition? We can go into these species here and try to identify one. So it's very, very important that we are aware of our um, potential to, to mine these um, different species. So in the second part of the talk, I will focus on applications of this technology. What I told you so far is uh, that we have the ability to express either inhibitors or excitators into different cells and control them with very high temporal precision. So one of the applications that we focused in our lab was for Parkinson disorder. Parkinson disorder is generated because of death of neurons in the substantia nigra, death of dopaminergic neurons. And this area is buried deep inside the brain. And when dopaminergic cells are lost in this area, it causes tremor, impaired movement, and later on, even cognitive deficit. So it's a very uh, disturbing disorder. And it's, despite years of research and a lot of focus, we still don't understand enough about it. So this is, um, please disregard the complexity of the circuit. It's, it's not even, all the players are not even indicated here. So I remember when I was an undergrad back at, uh, here at Caltech, um, I had a very interesting lecture from Professor Marian bronner Fraser, um, And it was interesting because I recently moved from Romania and my um, ability to read the English textbooks was not up to speed with that of my colleagues. And I went to class and they went through so much material. And then at some point she said something very short, but that stuck with me. And she said, we're teaching you all these pathways and all these connections, but take them with a grain of salt because next year they'll be different. Some of this will be wrong and we're gonna add much more. So I'm showing you what we are somewhat confident of now based on our research so far, but this is always, it's always useful to look with a critical eye and make sure that these are indeed the pathways and do your, your controls for yourself. So, but out of this diagram, we can learn something very important. Here is where the dopaminergic cells lie. Um, and we have the direct and the indirect pathway that controls motor behavior in humans. So when we lose our dopaminergic cells, we have reduced activity in the motor centers of the brain through both of these pathways. And one therapy is to implant electrodes into the subthalamic nucleus and thread a cord underneath the skin to a battery pack in the chest. And the battery pack supplies the right current intensity and frequency for this therapy to work well. You zap the brain at 100 hertz, and miraculously, this takes care of the tremor and of the um, impaired movement. And I'll show you a movie about uh, how this works. And this is not um, such a new therapy, although it has its origin in 93 with some, some experiments. And then it was FDA approved for uh, other indications as well, such as tremor and dystonia. And up to date, uh, quite a few patients have been treated, up to 60,000 patients. And I want to show you a movie as an example of how well this therapy works. And if you, we can also have the sound on. Temos uma ABS de liga e desligo de ABS. Você quer ver o que é o sofrimento? Para a Deus, Deus tem essa coisa. Olha só aqui. Ó. Dois segundos. Um, dois. Ai. Fica tranquilo. Agora estou com o Paxo. Real. É verdade, não estou mentindo. Isso aqui não é o, o Michael, jo Michael Fox. Como assim, com a limbó? Liga, liga. Isso aqui é parte. Vou, vou ligar de novo. Acredito se quiser. So what you just saw here um, is a person, a rather young uh, man with Parkinson disorder. The age of onset is rather early nowadays. And what he did, there was a reason why I chose a shirtless video. So you can see the battery pack 
on the chest. It was rather discreet, it's, it's hardly visible. But what he did, he had a magnet to stop his stimulator. So you could see that he was speaking just fine and moving just fine before he touched that magnet onto the skin. And that affected the battery pack and cut the current to the stimulator. And then he started displaying all of the familiar symptoms of Parkinson's disorder. And this shows that just passing electrical current to the brain um, has rather miraculous effects on behavior. However, very little is understood about this therapy, and there are side effects. When the electrode passes current in this area, there's also areas involved not only in uh, motor control, but in cognitive behavior as well, and emotional behavior. So you can get some pretty odd side effects. Some patients report uh, tendency to gamble more or some inappropriate conduct when their stimulator is on. And they go to the neurosurgeon, they explain, and they uh, get back to their good behavior with a tweak of a switch. So it would be good to understand what causes the side effects in order to minimize them. And um, although there's quite a bit of research on deep brain stimulation, our knowledge is rather limited about the mechanism. So what we tried to do was to understand this by using optogenetics because it's very important even for future therapies. I um, gave you the example for Parkinson's disorder, but the therapy has been approved by FDA for obsessive compulsive disorder and is being considered for depression as well. Of course, different brain areas are involved and the electrodes are located in other brain areas, but our understanding about those specific circuits could minimize side effects. So what we did in, uh, in the lab was to use optogenetics in an animal model of Parkinson's disorder to turn on and off defined circuits and see which circuits will cause the therapeutic behavior. So um, what you see here is the walking path of a rodent, of a Parkinsonian rodent, over two minutes. And you can see it's rather stagnant. So their behavior is impaired and they cannot move too much. So when you introduce opsins in specific circuits that I'll tell you about in the future slides and apply light, the rodent can freely walk around in the chamber. And that um, is an immediate effect. As the light is on, you can have the rodent walking, and when it's off, it returns back to its frozen behavior. We do this in animal models because we have the ability to get very quantitative results. And I want to tell you about a model that's been very useful to improve the dopaminergic therapy and the electrical deep brain stimulation therapy for Parkinson patients for many years now. And this model is the 6-hydroxydopamine toxin lesion of dopaminergic neurons. I mentioned that in humans, when you lose your dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, you lose your motor functions. And what we can do with the 6-hydroxydopamine toxin is to inject the toxin in the same, in the corresponding brain area in the rodents and damage the dopaminergic neurons only on half side of the brain. So here there is a brain slice, and in red you can see a marker for the dopaminergic cells. And when you introduce the toxin, you can damage all of the dopaminergic cells on one side of the brain, but spare the other side. And we do this bias lesion because when you inject a drug to release the dopamine, you will get a circular behavior. One side of the brain is still functioning, but the other one is not. So when you try to move, you will be forced in the circular uh, behavior. And we can count those numbers, and we can apply either dopamine treatment or electrical stimulation treatment to reverse that, or screen for new drugs or new therapies and see, can we affect the count? And this is a very good way to improve existing therapies and create new therapies. So I'll show you how this behavior is being done. What you'll see here is a rodent that was lesioned on one side of the brain, and we implanted an electrical stimulator very similar to the one that the gentleman in the movie had um, to confirm that we create a Parkinson phenotype, and by using electrical stimulation in the same centers in the rodent, we can achieve a therapeutic effect. So, um, okay. So what we have here is the unilateral Parkinsonian model spinning around in the cylinder test. And now we start the electrical stimulation, and you'll see that the behavior becomes balanced. So now the animal is able to move both ways, which indicates that both sides of the brain 
are involved in motor control. And it even does something that without the stimulation would not be able to. It can climb the walls and have fine grasp control. So the same therapy that works in humans works in this animal model, and we can very well um, screen for new therapies. So what we did with this rodent model was to use optogenetics and ask what precise circuit should we modify and in what way should we modify in order to obtain uh, therapeutical effects. How do we get the opsins from the alga into the animal brain, into the living animal brain? Um, who has a cold today? No? It's viral season, and viruses are very good at infecting us, and we usually don't like them, or I think always we don't like them. However, in our lab, they can be our allies. So what we do, we use the properties of viruses to infect cells to get our opsins where we want. And we modify the opsins, and we put them into viral vectors that are also modified to be safe for delivery. So we affect their structure so they cannot uh, propagate themselves and they can confine the infectivity to the regions that we want. This is um, a capsid for a lentivirus. And what we can do is to put our opsin DNA into a DNA vector. And in front of the, of the DNA, we attach a sequence that's called promoter. And this promoter is very important depending on the nature of it we can tell the opsin to be expressed in inhibitory cells or excitatory cells or cells of support, depending what cell types of interest we have for the experiment. So a very careful choice of promoter is critical. We make the vector and then we package it into a virus. We produce the virus and we purify it and then we use an injection needle to deliver the virus to the design brain structure. All of the surrounding cells in the area will pick up the virus, but only the ones that can recognize the promoter would express the opsin. So this gives the specificity of expression. And this is the method that we use to apply the light. So we inject virus into the desired area, and in this case is the subthalamic nucleus, which is the area that's stimulated for deep brain stimulation in Parkinson patients. We inject the virus and then we apply a fiber optic in order to deliver the light. And in this area, you're gonna have a mix of cells that express the opsin and that don't express the opsin, but only the cells that express the opsin and have the light will be modulated. In this case, yellow light indicates inhibition of the neurons. And very interestingly, this can very well control only defined areas. This is a bright field picture of the subthalamic nucleus area. And you can see there's not too many, there are not too many elements that are interesting here. Everything seems rather homogeneous. So when you place an electrode here, the electrode doesn't see the differences. However, if you approach it from an optogenetic fashion, you can express the opsins only in the subthalamic nucleus. And this is because the promoter was chosen, in this case is CAMKTU-alpha, to only be expressed by excitatory cells. And this area that's crucial for the therapy for Parkinson in the brain stimulation only expresses excitatory cells in an embedded inhibitory network. So you won't see any cells expressing below or above. So when we place our fiber optic to deliver the light, we can basically genetically and optically isolate, isolate only this area. While with the electrode, this won't be possible. And at the same time, we can use the technique that I t uh, mentioned at the beginning of the talk to record our ability to either inhibit or excite circuits. So in this case, you can see that baseline level of activity in a Parkinsonian rodent is hyperactivity of the subthalamic nucleus. When we apply yellow light, we can reduce that activity. And we can study the effects on both the neuronal activity and behavior. What was interesting, though, is that this experiment did not work. Um, and many of them don't work. Usually you hear only about the experiments that work, so I wanted to make sure I show you one that didn't. And why is this interesting? Because all previous literature suggested that this one should work. When we lose dopaminergic cells in the Parkinsonian brain, the subthalamic nucleus becomes hyperactive. There's more activity in that nucleus. When we apply chemical inhibitors, 
we reduce the symptoms. When we apply electrical stimulation, we reduce the symptoms. Therefore, the conclusion in the field was that electrical stimulation might act by silencing the nucleus. If the disease nucleus is hyperactive, silencing it should restore the behavior. So that's what we try to do with absence, to silence the hyperactive nucleus um, with the natural conclusion that we should restore the behavior. However, this didn't happen. Uh, we tried it very hard, and we did our controls. The electrical controls worked. And we questioned our tools uh, for a very long time. And then I remembered what Marianne bronner Fraser told me. From time to time, question the diagrams too. So I went back to the wiring diagram. Remember the diagram I showed you um, at the beginning of this clinical part? It had some players, but not all of them. And I was so focused on those players alone and trying to modify only those. However, that circuit that I showed you is sitting within a broader context, and there's many other connections that could be important in this therapy. And one critical connection is between cortex and the subthalamic nucleus. There are projections, excitatory projections from cortex to the subthalamic nucleus that control activity in this area, in addition to all of the local nuclei. So when you place an electrode into the subthalamic nucleus, not only you affect the local players, but you could affect long-ranging projections as well. You could affect things at a distance that we fail to appreciate at the beginning when we are focusing our experiments only on the local nuclei. So what we did instead was to identify a system where we can have our opsin expressed in this projection. So the experiment before had the inhibitory opsin expressed in the cells in the subthalamic nucleus. This did not work. So now we express the excitatory opsin in the excitatory projection from the cortex to the subthalamic nucleus, and we repeated the same exact experiment. What you can see here is the system. So we have expression. These are cell bodies completely depleted of the opsin, but we have expression in the axons, in the connections from the cortex to the subthalamic nucleus. And very interestingly, when we did this experiment and we recorded what, what's the action on the nucleus, when we stimulated at very high frequency our nucleus, we obtained a paradoxical inhibition of activity in the nucleus. When we stimulated at low frequency, we just introduced noise. Nice ringtone, by the way. So um, why is this interesting? Because in patients, when the neurosurgeon um, adjusts your stimulator, they can step up through the frequency space. And if they're below 70 hertz, and even worse, if they hit 20 hertz, the tremor is increased. So you can exacerbate tremor in a Parkinsonian case by using 20 hertz low stimulation frequency. However, if you ha are in the high frequency range, 100 hertz, the tremor goes away. So it's the same brain area, it's the same stimulator, but the frequency is different. And we notice the same duality in, in our system, in our experimental system. High frequency would cause a very different neuronal activity profile than low frequency. And even more, this parallel the behavior results. This is a count of the circulatory behavior. High numbers mean a lot of rotations, which is more Parkinsonian symptoms. Low numbers mean balanced behavior. So here we start without light. We applied light to our circuits. And each individual rodent goes back to a more balanced state. And when we turn our light off, so this is high frequency stimulation optical this time. When we turn the light off, the rodents return back to their biased behavior. And when we do the same experiment in low frequency case, we get the opposite effect. We get more rotations, more pathological behavior. So this was very interesting because it suggested us that the superficial circuit might be involved in the effects. And this could have quite interesting um, implications for clinics, as I will show you in a, in a moment. So let's imagine that we have the connection from motor cortex to the subthalamic nucleus. One node of access is in the subthalamic nucleus. So you can place implants into this deep nucleus and control behavior. However, there is quite a bit of tissue in between the entry of the brain and the location of the nucleus. 
What this suggests is that there are alternative pathways that maybe we should start exploring, more superficial pathways that if we have enough knowledge and power to control those, we can modulate them from the surface and spare all of this area in between. So this was done in rodents. How relevant is this really for the human case? I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the mouse brain is tiny, tiny, and the human brain is rather large. And we studied the circuits um, in animal models. How translatable are they? So these experiments show that we have the circuit from the cortex to the subthalamic nucleus in rodents. So I'm happy to report that the neurosurgeon at Stanford I was working with, Dr. Jamie Henderson, he did diffusion tensor imaging in his Parkinson patients. And this is a technology that allows you to see axons in the brain in defined regions. So he imaged the brain of his um, patients in an attempt to find those tracks, to find those superficial nodes of access. And this is one of those scans. And what you can see here is fibers going from the cortex and meeting into the subthalamic nucleus. So the same pathway, there is indication that the same pathway is also present in humans. And interesting uh, clinical experiments that he's doing now is to place arrays, recording arrays on the cortex while he stimulates the subthalamic nucleus to, ch to see which precise areas he's modulating. And then there is the potential if we identify those areas and we know in, each wa in what way to modulate them, you could access them from the surface. Of course, there's many, many details to work through, but this is just the, the beginning of a potentially new angle. So I'm very glad you're still here with me, especially given the competition. So if you check our uh, website, um, I was slightly worried because back in my days, if I had a choice, um, so these are memories from a more fit past, but that happens many times. Promise to get back in shape after I do the experiments, which might take a while. <laughs> so now, before I wrap up, I want to give you just one final example that will show you that not only can we affect motor behavior, but we could also affect mood and cognitive behavior by using this uh, methodology. So what you'll see here is a test that neuroscientists many times use to measure the stress level of um, rodents or their anxiety level. It's called the elevated plasmase. And you can see here the plus sign. Two of the arms are, have walls, and two of the arms are, uh, don't have walls. Mice are very anxious creatures. They're naturally anxious. So when you place them in this environment, they want to hide in the corner next to the wall, preferably without light. So what you can do is to change the circuits and see if you can bypass this shyness. And what we did here was to put the excitatory opsin in a circuit that's known, even from human fMRI studies, to be activated by fearful stimuli, the amygdala. So we placed them in particular cell types in the amygdala, and we were able to activate those cells. And let's see what happens to the behavior. Now there's no light on. So we have the fiber optic connected to the rodent's brain. And the animal prefers to stay in the safety of the enclosed spaces. And we'll turn the light on as will be indicated by blue uh, writing in the corner. And pay attention to what the animal does. Light is on, 20 hertz. Got more brave, suddenly. So when light will be off, as indicated now, something even more interesting happens. Well, in a way expected, goes back to its baseline behavior. But why? The animal already knows that there's no danger here. So in the wild, there is a risk associated with going far in open space. But there's also a reward. So the risk is that you might get eaten. 
the reward is that might, you might get to eat or you might get to mate. So you always have to balance those rewards and risks and see if it makes sense at that time. And there are circuits in the brain that control this switch. And in this case, we were able to um, turn them and see um, what would drive the animal towards a more exploratory behavior versus a more confined behavior. So I want to get to the, to the end by going back to the beginning, the origin of this opsins. Um, so the channelodopsin comes from a single cellular organism, Chlamydomonas reinhardti. The halorodopsin comes from Natronomonas pharaonis, from a lake in the Sahara Desert. Um, that lake might evaporate soon. This is Volvox carteri, yet another source for a red-shifted excitatory opsin. And these are all the variants with very different origins. So the, this was an unlikely player for neuroscience. The study of opsin started in 1985 in Germany in the lab of Peter Hegemann, who was studying them because they were beautiful and had no idea to use them for neuroscience. In 1999, Francis Crick unrelatedly mentioned, we have this huge challenge in neuroscience. We need to control different cell types, but we have no way to do it. Maybe we could use light to do it. Time went by. 2003, 2004, channel adoption was published. Internet was more powerful, more people saw it. It was not only for the microbial community anymore. They all thought we were cool. Even back there in 85, they were very, very cool, but neuroscientists didn't know about them. So in 2003, 2004, people were paying attention, and they made the connection. In 2005, Carl Dysrat used them for neuroscience, and then the field exploded. And many labs helped develop these efforts. So I want to acknowledge what it took to prepare this talk, about 25 years of work and hundreds of people. And these are just some names in no particular order of people that were involved in generating some of the tools that I talked about today and in um, creating some of the experimental paradigms. And I want to emphasize my um, recognition for the Dysart Lab at Stanford that initiated the technology and for my lab members that are working hard to continue to grow it and use it to its maximum potential. So uh, with uh, this, I will take questions on stage. And thank you so much for staying all this time. <laughs>